There is this nurse in Florida who lives in a community that happens to have, thank goodness, not much COVID-19 activity. And her area of expertise is critical care. She read about the surge that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is in the middle of. And she thought to herself, I'm a critical care specialist, and the community that I live in doesn't need a lot of energy because, thank God, we don't have much COVID-19. But in Massachusetts, they need nurses just like me. And so she said goodbye to her husband. She said goodbye to her children. She said goodbye to her home and to her community. And she traveled to Massachusetts to start treating patients at the height of its surge. And she went straight away to one of our hospitals, to the critical care unit, to the COVID unit, and started doing her sacred work. She ran towards the population that the rest of us are running away from. She was interviewed on NPR. And the NPR reporter said to her, wow, and thank you for being in Massachusetts. We could really use your expertise. Just one question. Are you at all nervous about getting infected in treating the sickest of the COVID-19 patients? And she said, no. I'm using PP&E, I'm taking all the proper precautions. I don't worry about getting infected. I worry, am I doing my part? Now, when I heard that story about this remarkable nurse, I had two reactions, and at the same time. The first reaction is admiration. If there's a stronger word than admiration, reverence, respect, worshipful gratitude for the kind of heroism and the kind of idealism to leave your home and to leave your family and to leave your community and go to a place you don't live precisely to treat the sickest patients during the most intensive time of search. Who has words? to capture the gratitude, respect, reverence, admiration, awe for her and for all of our doctors and all of our nurses and all of our medical care professionals who are doing this holy and scary work. We don't have words but to say thank you and we have the deepest admiration possible. And at the same time, I had another reaction Another reaction of a feeling that is deeply felt, I believe broadly shared, and also very underexplored, and that is, what about the people who feel bad that in this moment where they should be stepping up, they're not really stepping up? What if people feel bad about how they're doing during the COVID-19 lockdown? What if it is true that adversity reveals our character, and what if the character that you see revealed by this tremendous and ongoing adversity is not character that you're particularly proud of? What if you say something like, I'm not stepping up. Uh, I'm eating too much. I'm just stress eating. Uh, one day, I consumed an entire container of salted caramel ice cream. I, I didn't even realize I had done it. And then I had to ask Siri, hey Siri, what's bigger, a pint or a quart? <laughs> and Siri said a quart. And I realized I had just, before I even knew it, eaten an entire quart of salted caramel ice cream. I'm not proud of that. That's not heroic. I'm drinking too much. I'm drinking too much. I used to drink, you know, socially. Uh, be out with friends on a Saturday night. Now, I need a drink or two drinks at the end of the day to take the sting out of the day, to numb the pain, 
for the first time in my life, I'm drinking every night to numb the pain. And I'm not proud of it. I'm sleeping terribly, fitfully. First of all, I have these dreams. They're colorful, they're lurid, they're florid, they're wild. And often I can't even remember them. All I know is that when I get up in the morning, I feel like a truck hit me. And I don't feel rested. And then I look at myself in the mirror, and I groan. And I wonder every day now for five plus weeks, how am I going to make it through another day? I'm not proud of myself. I worry about money, and I worry about my job, and I worry whether I'm going to have a job, and I worry whether my spouse is going to have a job, and I worry whether my kids are going to go into free fall. I'm really worrying my kids not go into free fall. I am doing my best to hold myself together, and I don't think I'm doing a good job. I am doing my best to hold my family together, my home together, and I worry I'm not doing a good job. So this nurse from Florida who leaves Florida to come to our surge, yes, she's amazing. And her very amazingness makes me feel even smaller. Her very amazingness makes me even feel worse about myself. Now, if you feel like your nobler angels are not asserting themselves, if the character that you see that is revealed by this adversity is something you're not particularly proud of, you're not alone, that's for sure. And I want to offer you a prayer. This is not a prayer that I've ever seen in any Siddur. This is not a prayer I've ever seen in the pages of the Torah. This is not a prayer I've ever seen in the pages of the Talmud or any Jewish philosopher. This is a prayer that comes from my heart. I say this prayer, especially now, especially the last five weeks, I've been saying this prayer. And I offer you my humble prayer in case it might be helpful to you. I pray, Lord, help me be gentle with myself. Lord, help me be gentle with myself. I pray that God is going to help me be okay with me as I am in all of my imperfection right now. I pray that God is going to help me cut myself some slack. Now here's my question. Is this a valid Jewish prayer? Is there some reason why this prayer is in no Siddur? Well, it certainly does not sound like the Jewish prayers that all of us have been saying. Classic Jewish prayer asks us to confront our shortcomings. Ashamnu, Bogadnu, Gazalnu, Dibarnu Dofi. We abuse, we betray, we are cruel, we destroy. Now that's a Jewish prayer. <laughs> God, guard my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking falsehood. God, help me take up my speech game. Help me use words to heal and not words to hurt. Help me be a better version of me. Now that's a classic Jewish prayer. Or the Misha Barach Lecholim, a prayer for those we say every day, twice a day. We plead with God to direct God's love and attention on other people, on their healing, worrying about other people. That's a classic Jewish prayer. But my prayer doesn't take me to task. My prayer does not ask me to confront my shortcomings. My prayer does not 
asked me to be a better version of me. And my prayer is not about anybody else but me. And my prayer is about God help me be okay with me as I am, even if the me that I am is not the me that I should be. Help me be good with that. How is that possibly a good Jewish prayer? So I think there are some challenges to this prayer, but I would say it's a really good Jewish prayer, and it's a really good Jewish prayer for right now. And I'll tell you my sources. The first source is from Numbers 9 that we read during Chol Moed Pesach, and it tells the story of Pesach Sheni, the second Pesach. So as you know, Pesach is a big deal in the Torah. The very first mitzvah to the Jewish people in Exodus 12, Shabbat HaChodesh, we read it a few weeks before Pesach, is Pesach is a big deal. On the 14th of Nisan, God says, I want you to offer a Paschal sacrifice. I want you to tell the story of the Exodus. And the Torah repeats this mitzvah, deliver a Paschal sacrifice, tell the story of the Exodus, time and time and time again. And it says it's from generation to generation, parents and children, grandparents and grandchildren. And it says this is forever. It's a forever mitzvah. It's till the end of time. Jews are supposed to be doing this Exodus and Paschal sacrifice mitzvah on the 14th of Nisan. And if you don't do it, the Torah says you take yourself out of the Jewish people. So it's not only big, it is categorically big. It is definingly big. And that makes Pesach Sheni such a striking case. What's the second Pesach? Pesach Sheni in Numbers 9, there's two categories of people who come to Moses and God and say, you know, I know that Pesach is a big deal. And I know that I should have offered that Paschal sacrifice on the 14th of Nisan, but, but life got in the way. One category of life got in the way is I was out of town. Work called. I was on a work assignment. And therefore, I could not offer it up. And God says, okay. Life got in the way. You were derech rechoka, far away. Do it next month, Pesach Sheni. And the second category is somebody who says, there was a death in my family. And my heart's not in it. I'm not a machine. I can't get in this communal religious space. There was a death in my family. And my heart is broken. And I've come into contact with the dead. And all I can think about is that. I can't think about the Passover story. And God says, I get that. Life got in the way. You are a heart. You're not a machine. Why don't you do this in a month? In both cases, God is abundantly merciful. It's the God that we read when we take out the Torahs on holidays, the 13 attributes of mercy. Adonai, Adonai, Al-Rachum, V'chanun, Erech, Apayim, V'av Chesed, V'emet. God, you are abundantly merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in kindness and faithfulness. This is the God of second chances. We believe in the God of second chances. The God of Pesach Sheni is the God who says to the Israelites, if you couldn't do it because life got in the way, I'm going to give you a second chance. And I think the God of second chances is telling us who are living through the coronavirus crisis, if your nobler angels aren't coming out yet, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Got time. It'll come out. Next month. I was speaking with a very good friend who is a very long time and active member of our shul. This friend comes to shul, you know, pretty much every Shabbos and has for 30 years. And he said that he really misses the temple and he misses the inside of the temple. And in fact, he knows he can't enter into our building because it's closed, but he walks around the, he walks around the synagogue just to get a glimpse of it, even though he can't enter into it. And he said he's been regularly following our stream services, the morning services, the evening services, the Shabbat services. Uh, he said 
it's very comforting to him. It's comforting that prayers are still being uttered in the Rabbi Chill Sanctuary in the middle of a pandemic. It is comforting that in the middle of a pandemic, prayers are still being uttered in the Gan Chapel. It is comforting that in the middle of a pandemic, the five clergy are coming together every day to pray and to share words of Torah and tefillah with our community. So it's not the same as being here, but even seeing and hearing the prayers from behind a screen is comforting. So he told me the story that one Shabbos morning, he had his device on to our Shabbat morning service. And it was on in his office, on his desk. And he confessed to doing other things while the service was going on, comforting background noise. He was multitasking on God. And at a certain point in the service, the young girl who was the bat mitzvah that Shabbat morning started to do her part. She started to lead the Shema. And he said, you know, um, I love Elias' davening. And I always prefer to hear Elias' davening. But my own kids had their turn on the podium. And they led services. And this was this girl's turn. And therefore, my job as an adult member of the community was to sit respectfully and listen to her as she led the services. But it was still from a distance and he was still doing other things. And then he noticed something. He noticed something about this girl. He noticed that she was leading the Shema from her home, from her kitchen. He realized that she came of age during the COVID-19 lockdown. And there she was with a talis on. There she was, all of 13 years old, in the middle of a pandemic, reciting the Shema, bound and determined to not let a pandemic get in her way. And it melted his heart. He put away the other things that he was doing. He got up and got a yarmulke and put on a yarmulke. He got up and put on a talis. He got out his sidur, and he said he davened the rest of the service with her and with us. The pathos of that moment claimed him. The pathos of this moment claims us all. I believe that the pathos of this moment claims God. It's just a dire time. And we all could use a little bit of extra mercy. Fortunately, the God that we believe in is full of mercy. And so I pray, Lord, please help me be gentle with myself. Shabbat Shalom.